I want to honor Pastor Aaron and Pastor Becky. Can we give them an incredible round of applause? They are two of the most amazing leaders, pastors, and friends that a person can ever ask for. And I want to, I love you guys. and Thank you guys for your leadership. It is a privilege to serve under you guys. Come on, give them one more hand, guys. They're amazing. So, hey, we've been in a series titled Rule and Reign. And... Uh, Today's the last day of that series, so I get the privilege of closing that series out. It's been an incredible series, uh, but over the past few weeks, we've been in this sub-series of Rule and Reign titled, The Weeds of Your Heart. And it's this idea that Jesus is the master gardener, that he is the master gardener. And we have these spiritual weeds inside of our heart that tend to choke out the things of God. And in order for us to rule and reign properly, especially in these last days, we need Jesus to do some gardening inside of our heart. And today... I want to talk to you about weeding out the weed of spiritual apathy in the believer's life. Weeding out the weed of spiritual apathy in the believer's life. What is apathy? Apathy basically is a lack of interest. It's a lack of enthusiasm. It is a lack of concern. It is a lack of feeling or emotion. It is a lack of interest, enthusiasm, concern, feeling, or emotion. And in the book of Revelation chapter 3, John is writing to the church of Sardis. And he's writing a pretty grave warning to this church that I believe we as a church today can grab a hold of and apply it to our own lives. It's almost like he's talking to the church now, but he was writing this some 2,000 years ago. But before I do that, I wanna give you a little bit of the history and the context surrounding this scripture. I'm gonna do a little teaching this morning. Is that okay, City Point family? You see, Sardis at one point was the capital of the kingdom of Lydia, which today is modern-day Turkey. At one point, this city was known for being the greatest city in the world. Imagine that. Sardis, in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, as he's writing to this church, was once known as the greatest city in the world. You see, the city of itself was the center of the dyeing industry where they dyed clothes and they dyed fabric. It was the center, uh, it, it, was the, it, was the, it was the meeting point for different traffics of goods and informations. It was a crossroads of trade, uh, so to speak. It was an ideal meeting point for the exchange of ideas, beliefs, concerns, knowledge, and new insights. They worshiped many gods in this city. It was an incredible, incredible city in its splendor. Uh, the city was also well fortified by a wall all the way around it, and it was deemed impenetrable. But if you study the history of this city, you'll find that that wall was indeed breached two to three times throughout history. And one of those times happened in 547 B.C., when the Persian army was able to invade and penetrate this wall. And in fact, it was by the very careless act of a wall guard uh, that, that, that would lead to the invasion of the Persian army. You see, during this time, there was a dangerously high slope that led up to this wall. It was full of rocks and cliffs and crags. And so when armies would come up against this city, they would see this slope, and they wouldn't be able to penetrate the city because they couldn't even get past the slope. It was so steep. And one day, uh, one evening, there was a Persian uh, soldier who was just watching from a distance, and a prison, or a prison guard, a, a, a wall guard was leaning over the wall, and his helmet fell down. And it went down the in steep embankment, and it kind of went down. And so this Persian guard, uh, Persian army guy, was watching this guy as he came down the wall, as he navigated this, this slope that went down and picked his helmet up. And then he watched how he went back a bit in the wall. And lo and behold, later that night, this guy led a band of raiders up that same embankment, the same pathway this guy took up into the wall. And lo and behold, when they got up there, there was nobody guarding this section of the wall because the city was so overconfident that nobody could get past this wall and this barrier. So John, when he is writing this letter to the church of Sardis, he's coming from this historical perspective of the city that thinks it's something, but really it's nothing. It's the city that boasts of great wealth, great riches, and great confidence, but was overtaken because of the careless act of a wall guard who was not paying attention, who was not awake, so to speak, who was asleep uh, at the helm, who was not being watchful of the present danger that was ensuing around the city. So turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. We're going to read verse 1 through 3, and I'm reading out of the ESV version. Oh, that's a nice ringtone. Whose is that? Who is that? Clay, is that you? <laughs> that was beautiful music. <laughs> okay, uh, verse 1. 
And to the angel of the church in Sardis write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. He says this. He says, I know your works, that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, hint, hint, like the thief in the wall, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. This morning, I would highly encourage you guys to take notes. What does Pastor Aaron say? Those who take notes get into heaven first. Is that, is that, was that correct? Is that, is, did I? So the title of the message is Wake Up. Let's pray, guys. Father God, I just thank you, Lord, for who you are. I thank you, God, for what you're doing in this moment, in this hour, in this season. God, I pray over this message today, God, I pray that you would use it, God, that you would use it, Lord, to strengthen us, to encourage us, Father. Lord, open up our eyes, our ears, and our hearts, God, so that we may see you, know you, and hear you. In Jesus' name we pray, and if you agree with that prayer, shout out me in amen. amen. Well, have you guys ever slept through something? Have you ever forgot to like, maybe you double booked on a, your calendar, or maybe, you know, you, you forgot about an important meeting or something like that. Well, here recently, I actually slept through one of my alarms, and uh, lo and behold, it was for one of our early morning men's prayers, uh, the 6 a.m. prayer, and I woke up to the resounding buzzing of my phone of Pastor Aaron uh, texting me saying, where are you? Are you awake yet? And uh, to which I replied in the text, yeah, I just woke up, man. What's going on? And then in that moment, it hit me that I was a half hour late to the early morning prayer, which me and him were co-leading together. And you know that feeling, right? When, you, when, when you're later, you oversleep an alarm, and you wake up out of bed, man. Your body just goes, whoop, like that, right? Your heart's beating a million miles an hour, right? Your head is racing. You don't know what to do, and you rip off the covers, man, and you get out. You're putting on your clothes, right? You might put them on inside out. You forget your underwear, right? You're brushing your teeth. You know, you put a hat on, and, you know, and then you, you jet out the door. Totally not my intention, man, but I felt so horrible when I got here, man. It was just in disarray, man. The guys were just running around. The lights on the stage were on. Clay had some weird music playing on in the background. And so I just, I felt really bad, you know, at that time. Again, totally unintentional, but what about, what about those moments in season in our lives when we're intentional about skipping an alarm, right? When we're intentional about skipping out on a meeting, or a date, or an assignment, uh, or an obligation, right? Totally thinking about ourselves and what we feel like at the moment while not giving regards to the person or persons that we may be affecting while doing it, right? I mean, we sign up for certain things, you know, we, events and classes uh, only to skip out the last minute because we're just not quite feeling it at the time. You know, we, we live in this meh generation, you know, where everything is just meh. We even have one of those little faces on uh, the iPhone, you know, it's like the meh phone, right? Everything is just meh, right? Right, you hear a convicting, amazing message like Pastor Aaron spoke a few weeks ago about the woke spirit, and we get out to our car only to realize that the work I have to put in as a Christian to overcome those demons, to press in even longer, seems too much for me, so I just do nothing instead. Why is it that you and I can turn on the news, we can scroll through Facebook, we can see the news article that is happening over in Afghanistan about Christians being slaughtered, about the Taliban going door to door, slaughtering Christians and just leaving their bodies in the street. We may say a quick prayer, but then we just flip the channel to our favorite TV show. Or we keep scrolling down and start laughing at all of these different memes. I believe that the problem is apathy. It is a lack of concern. It is a lack of interest, it is a lack of feeling, and a lack of emotion. You see, spiritual apathy is one of those things that is unseen, yet it is rampant in the church. It is rampant in our homes, it is rampant in our relationships, it is rampant amongst society. It is a cancer that feeds off of stress, fear, and anxiety. It feeds off of overexertion, busyness, uh, right? It separates and it isolates. If left unattended in the believer's life, check this out, the believer will become callous, lukewarm, disinterested, noncommittal, hardened to society, and the spiritual 
realm, it leaves you defenseless and renders you incompetent and unprepared to handle the things of this world. We deal with a filthy little word in the church, and his name is apathy. His name is apathy. And let's just face it, man, with everything going on in this world at this moment in time, we have, as Christians, don't have time to be lukewarm, calloused, or apathetic. We don't have the time because the days are evil. The days are few. Robbie Dawkins has an incredible quote. If you don't know who Robbie Dawkins is, you need to look him up. He, uh, I believe he's still on scene in the Middle East trying to rescue the underground church out of Afghanistan. He has been, uh, he has been evangelizing and, mi and, and a missionary in Afghanistan, planting churches. He is a pastor and leader, an incredible, incredible gift of healing on his life as well. But he says this about, about lukewarm Christianity. He says, the greatest danger this world faces is not radical Islam, it's not the Taliban, it's not ISIS, it's not Putin or China or all these other things. The greatest uh, uh, danger this world faces is lukewarm Christianity. And I believe that. I believe that. Why? Because uh, God has created us to make a difference. He has created us to make an impact. He handed us the baton when he ascended back up to the Father, and he gave us his Holy Spirit to make an impact in this world. And we cannot do that if we are lukewarm, calloused, or apathetic. So how did we get here? Well, first off, I believe apathy can be caused by being overworked. Overworked, overwhelmed, right, from all the stresses and the struggles in life and school and work and family and friends and media and COVID and masks and masks and masks and masks, right, and vaccines and mandates and all this other stuff. And I believe this happens because of the frequency of the information that you and I face every single day. It's on the news, it's on Facebook, it's on Instagram, it's on TikTok, it's on every single channel, it's in everybody's mouth, right? It's so much frequency coming in that we get so overwhelmed that we do nothing instead. And if we take it a little bit further, it spills into our spiritual life as well. And that little cancer called apathy takes over the believer's heart. Where we're uninvolved, Right, where our passions and our interests and our concerns are just kind of meh, <laughs> meh. I struggled this week because I was dealing with apathy while I'm writing this. Man, I woke up Monday going, I don't want to write this message. Meh, you know, <laughs> meh. You know, I was just like, God, why don't I want to write this message on apathy? Let me just play a game instead. You know, it was just one of those. <laughs> and then it dawned on me, like, Rick, I'm trying to teach you something in this moment, right? <laughs> and so, second. Apathy can be caused by a lack of willingness to move forward in our spiritual walk, right? In our spiritual life, in our sanctification process, right? First Thessalonians 4.3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. It is God's will that the believer be set apart from this world, right? That we go from glory to glory, faith to faith, right? Uh, we go from the mountaintops to the valleys, from the valleys to the mountaintops. God wants to work in and through you and on your heart. But because of apathy, we turn ourselves off. From that, maybe it's out of fear of, uh, of what might lie ahead. Maybe it's out of fear of looking like a crazy man like Pastor Aaron and Pastor Rick jumping up and down, running around the sanctuary. That's fun, you guys. You got to try it sometime. It is so fun to jump and run around during worship. And so the third aspect, I believe, is just plain laziness, just being a slacker. Right, Not wanting to be convicted, not wanting to have a concern because we don't want to be involved. Why? Because we get comfortable in our spiritual walk. And when we get comfortable in our spiritual walk, we become apathetic because I'm comfort. Why would I want to change? Why would I want to move? Why would I want to do anything? Because I love my life. I'm so comfortable in my little tiny box. And the fourth thing I believe apathy can be caused when we think that greatness is in our past. That I've been there I've done that. I'm in cruise control. I'm in the fourth quarter of my life, man, and I'm just going to cruise right on in to the kingdom of heaven. So we think greatness is in our path, so we turn off that, you know, we, <clears throat> we turn off to spiritual things because someone else is doing it already. I used to have a gift in this, but, you know, right now I'm retired from all that. I'm just cruising through life. Apathy. Don't allow apathy to grip your hearts. Let's go back to the scripture, verse 1. 
John says this, he says, you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. In other words, it looks good on the outside, but inside, you're dead. You have the appearance of being alive. You have incredible lights and sound and an incredible building, and you got all these programs and, you know, oh, the incredible kids program, but really inside, it's not what I am looking for. And then he says in verse 2, wake up. Wake up. Turn to your neighbor and shake them. And I want you to say, wake up, neighbor. Now grab their throat. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> you see, the church in Sardis metaphorically was asleep spiritually. Just like the city guards and the, 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 you know, the, the, the army of the wall were careless and asleep, so to speak, and the wall was penetrated. You see, when we're asleep spiritually or when we're asleep naturally, what are we paying attention to? Nothing. We're not paying attention to anything. And when we're in a deep sleep, what is our minds? Our minds are dead to the world. We're not aware of anything going on, and we're not even aware of the passage of time. Spiritual sleep is dangerous. This kind of spiritual sleep indicates insensitivity to responsibility. You and I have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to be the uncompromising, undiluted, radical body of Christ in this time, in this moment, in history. To make a difference in this world, God has ordained you and I to be alive for such a time as this, and he has gifted us with the Holy Spirit to make a difference, to be uncompromised, to be undiluted, to be holy unto God. We have a responsibility to do that for this generation, but we cannot do it if we have a meh attitude. We just can't. And in fact, uh, if you read further in chapter 3, there, there's a warning to the church at Laodicea. The church of Laodicea was the lukewarm church. He said, I would rather you be hot or cold, but instead you're lukewarm. So because you're lukewarm, it is repugnant to my mouth, and I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. And I think it's really important to note that out of these two churches, the church in Sardis and the church of Laodicea, these two cities, they no longer exist. You can find the other churches in the other cities, but these two, they no longer exist. Why? Because they were the gravest warnings in Scripture. The gravest warning. So his warning to the church was wake up. And as believers, we need to be awake spiritually. We need to be awake. We need to be watchful. We need to be alert. We need to be vigilant. We need to be discerning the times that we are living and paying attention to what is going on around us, not just meanderly scrolling through the news articles, but really paying attention and saying, God, how can I make a difference? You say, Pastor Rick, I don't think I deal with spiritual apathy. I thought the same thing earlier this week. <laughs> and then I, and then I uh, measured myself up against these questions that I'm about to ask you. And so listen to these. Do you find yourself complaining a lot, but rarely have the solution or being actively involved in a solution? You may be dealing with apathy. Do you find yourself full of excuses when confronted with an opportunity to change you may be dealing with spiritual apathy. Are you so busy that you don't have time to invest in your own spiritual growth, your own prayer, your own devotion to God, so you do nothing instead? You may have a severe case of spiritual apathy. Do you find yourself scrolling past the news articles of the day without giving thought, prayer, or attention to them? Do you allow dysfunction in your family and even in your own life because the thought of tackling that dysfunction is so overwhelming so you do nothing instead and you allow it to linger? You may be dealing with spiritual apathy. Do you rely upon the pastor of your church to disciple and evangelize the community, not realizing that you too are a part of the body of Christ? Do you allow 10% of your home church, which is the average statistic, do you allow 10% of your home church to do all the siving, uh, the, the siving, all the serving, all the tithing, and all the volunteering without giving thought that you too have a part to play in the body of Christ? You may be dealing with spiritual apathy. 
You see, but I don't want us to get so stuck on this thing called spiritual apathy. Because you and I serve a God who is greater. And his name is Jesus Christ. And when we're dealing with the name spiritual apathy, it says every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The Bible says that Jesus is the name that is above all names. So when you line up spiritual apathy to the name of Jesus Christ, guess what? It has to bow its ugly head. And if you and I as a church are ever going to get over this thing called spiritual apathy, we need to connect to the vine and his name is Jesus Christ. We need to be connected. We need to allow him to work out these things in our life. In Luke chapter 10, verse 30 and 33, there's an incredible story about the uh, Good Samaritan. You guys are familiar with the story. We're not going to read the whole thing, but I want to read a few of the verses. It says, Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him, beat him, and he departed, leaving him half dead. Check this out. Now, by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, the Levite did the same thing, right? These are the two most religious people of the time. And maybe, just maybe, they didn't want to soil themselves because they were going to the temple. But how many times do you and I, in our life, pass by on the other side? You know, we see a need over here. Or we see something that the Holy Spirit says, hey, I want you to go pray for that person. I want you to go help that person. I want you to give that person money. I want you to go, you know, you feel that tug on your heart to go and help somebody. But instead, we pass by on the other side because we're not thinking about them. We're just thinking about us. Spiritual apathy will do that to the believer. It will cause us to become calloused and not be able to see the needs going on around us. So what's the cure for apathy? If I can have the band up, that would be awesome. I believe the cure for apathy is simply to just to wake up. You and I just need to simply wake up. We need to wake up from our spiritual sleep. We need to wake up from our spiritual slumber. Look at verse 2. John says this. He says, to wake up and to strengthen what remains and is about to die. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die. How do I strengthen what remains and is about to die, Pastor Rick? I believe the first thing you and I need to do is we need to take initiative in making a difference. We need to take initiative in making a difference. You say, Pastor Rick, how can I make a difference? I'm just one person. I'm just one person. There are so many problems going on inside the world. I cannot contain. I'm an information overload. And I would say to you, just pick one. That's all you got to do. Just pick one and make a difference. There's a story I read of a woman named Irina Sendler. I bet you've never heard of her. She was a member of the children's section of Zakota, which is the code name given for the Polish council to aid the Jews. And so in World War II, she, along with a dozen other members, saved more than 2,500 children from, 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 from being slaughtered uh, by, uh, by Hitler's army. And so what she would do would go in and she would smuggle these kids out posing as an inspector. She would put them in a basket. She would put them in body bags sometimes. She would have to convince their parents to let her take them, otherwise they were dead. That's how, uh, that's how delusional these, the Jews were back in Hitler's time because they thought that they were doing good. They thought that, they were there, uh, that their kids were going to be safe if they stayed with them. But she said no. She's seen a need and she made a difference. She put her foot down and she said someone has to do something and she did what do we need to do we need to take initiative in making a difference it's an action where you have to take initiative in your personal walk the second thing we need to take initiative is is to grow in our faith you and I need to take initiative to grow in our faith how do I do that pastor Rick it starts by reading the Word of God this word right here is so important to the believer's life. I just seen a statistic the other day that 60% of adults who call themselves Christians do not believe Jesus is the only way to get to to, to heaven. 60% of adults who say they are Christians do not believe Jesus is the only way. You know what that tells me? Nobody's reading this thing. Nobody's reading this thing. And so for the believer's life, I would encourage you guys, man, Add some time to your study. Just like Aaron said a few weeks ago, go out and get a physical Bible. 
Because the day and hour we are living in where truth is being censored and truth could be whatever you want it to be, we need to know what the source of truth says about the day and hour we are living in. Take initiative in reading your word. Take initiative in prayer. Add some time to your prayer life. Join us during the week here at City Point for midweek prayer. We have prayer going on every, just about every single day here from 12 to 1, Mondays and Wednesdays. And here soon on Tuesday nights, we're going to start another prayer session. Okay? And then on Thursday mornings, the men are praying, and then even the women are going to start praying on Thursday morning. So there is opportunity for you to add some time to your prayer. Let's just face it, man. We're living in a time where society... We're Christians, they're not spending time in the Word, and they're not praying, so we're asleep spiritually. We have a responsibility to take initiative in our own spiritual walk, in our own spiritual journey. We need to be connected to the vine. Join a life group here coming up in a few weeks. We're launching our fall session of life groups. I would highly encourage you guys to get connected into a life group. That's taking initiative in growing in your faith, staying connected to the vine. John, Jesus says in John 15, 4 uh, through 5, he says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit in itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, guess what? He is the one who bears much fruit. Then he sums it up with this, for apart from me, you can do nothing. We can do nothing apart from Jesus. We need to stay connected to him and take initiative in our faith. The third thing we need to do is to be on alert. We need to keep watch. We need to be awake. We need to have clear minds and clear thoughts. Peter warns us in 1 Peter 5 eight. he says, be alert, be of sober mind because your enemy, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion and he's seeking to devour you. He's seeking that. In, in, in the book of Genesis, it says that sin is crouching at your door and its desire is for you. And so with that in mind, you and I have an obligation to be on alert. We need to be watchful. We need to be vigilant. We need to be ready. We need to be suited and booted, just like Pastor Aaron talked about a few weeks ago, with the armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, if you want to look that up. The fourth thing you and I need to do is we need to combat comfort. We need to combat comfort in our situation. And I would highly encourage you guys, expose yourself and be intentional with exposing yourself to uncomfortable situations. What will that do, Pastor Rick? That will allow you to grow past where you're at now. You're only going to be as uh, you're only going to grow to where you're comfortable with. And so if we're constantly exposing ourselves to uncomfortable situations, that is going to expand our territory. It's going to expand ourselves. It's going to expand our tent pegs and we're going to be able to combat this thing called spiritual apathy. You will not grow in the comfort. We will not accomplish anything in the comfort. We need to get uncomfortable church. Hey, here, here's the deal. The devil doesn't mind getting uncomfortable. He doesn't mind putting Christians in those situations. But what happens is we just run from them because we're like, oh man, comfortability. I'm, I'm, let me get over here. We cannot do that church. We need to be the church of Jesus Christ. The fifth thing we need to do is we need to be intentional about our relationships. We need to be intentional about our relationships in our marriage, with our kids, with the Lord. Intentionality, you know what that takes? That takes motivation. That takes us stepping outside of ourselves. That takes us taking a step to be intentional about having that awkward conversation, about asking the Lord, maybe it's the hard things, about searching the scriptures to see whether what Pastor Rick and Pastor Aaron are preaching is true. We need to be intentional about those things, about our relationships in your marriage. If your marriage is on the rocks, so to speak, you both need to be intentional about connecting together. Intentionality is very huge. And the sixth and last thing we need to do is we need to remember our first love and we need to repent. Remember our first love. Remember, man, 
go back to when Jesus wooed you, when you guys were together, when you first got saved and you felt so alive and you wanted to tell everybody about Jesus and you were in his word night and day and you were praying and you were being intentional and you were making room for him. But somewhere along the way, we got comfortable. We put it in cruise control. We hit retirement and we're just coasting through life. We need to remember and then we need to repent. We need to turn away, man. We need to say no to spiritual apathy. We need to make a full U-turn. U-turn. We need to run towards the Father. We need to run towards Jesus. We need to put these things into practice. We need to take initiative with our faith. We need to take initiative with making a difference. We need to be on alert. We need to be watchful. We need to be ready because this present time, the days are evil. We need to combat comfort and we need to remember and we need to repent. Let's all stand to our feet. hot up here. What the hell we do? I need that fan. Man. So verse 3, let's finish this out. Verse 3, he says, remember then what you received and heard. Remember, remember, remember. Remember what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief. Like the Persian army did in the middle of the night, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what hour I come against you. Remember and repent. We need to realize that we as a church have a purpose. We have a reason to keep going when we feel like giving up. We have a reason to keep going when we feel unwanted and unneeded. We have a reason to keep going and His name is Jesus Christ. We must continue for Him. When times are dire, when times are stressful, when life is busy, we must continue. We must take initiative. We must press forward into our destiny. Even in the darkest hours, guess what? God is there. He is there. He is here right now in the darkest hour that I believe I have ever seen in my entire life. Guess what? He's there. And he's right in the middle of it. Okay, I, I just seen a post the other day, you posted it, about the church in Afghanistan, the underground church who was about 350 Christians has just ballooned to over 2,500 Christians in the past two weeks. Come on, the church is alive and well. We need to be encouraged, church. We serve a great God that if we can just get past spiritual apathy, we too can make a difference in this world. So I want to read this scripture over you. I, I think this scripture sums up exactly what I'm trying to say. It's in Romans chapter 13. And I want everyone to close their eyes. Paul says this. He says, do this knowing that it is a critical time. It is already the hour for you to awaken from your sleep of spiritual complacency. For our salvation is near to us. Now than when we first believed in Christ. The night this present evil age is almost gone and the day of Christ's return is almost here. So let us fling away the works of darkness and put on the full armor of light. Let us conduct ourselves properly and honorably as in the light of day, not in carousing, not in drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity or irresponsibility, not curling, quarreling or jealousy, but clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus and make no provision for the flesh, not even to think about gratifying that thing in regards to its improper desire. Well, Lord Jesus, I just want to thank you, God. Come on, let's lift our hands to heaven. Father, you see the hands lifted high. You see the hearts in this room, Father. I don't know who's dealing with spiritual apathy, God, but you do, Holy Spirit. You know who that is. So, Father, right now, search long and wide, Father, and just start to impress on the hearts of everyone in this room, Lord, those areas in our life where we need to do better, those areas in our lives where we need to submit to you, God, those areas in our lives where we need to submit to you, Father. Lord, I just pray right now, come on, let's just have a moment. I want you guys to just have a moment with Jesus. If you need to do business with him, just do business with him. In this moment, if you need to remember and repent, right now is your time. Come on, right now is your time. Thank you, God.
Jesus, Jesus. Come on, his name is Jesus. There is no condemnation. There's no condemnation. We just need to make a U-turn, church. The days of spiritual apathy are over. The days of hitting the, the spiritual snooze button is over for the church. It's time to arise. It is time to awaken from our sleep and our slumber. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, come on. Let's sing this. I hear the chains hit the ground. Come on, pick it up. I got a revival for it. Declare this church. Let's declare this. God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. I hear the chains hit the ground. Oh God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Come on, declare it. Come on, declare it. Come on, declare it. Pour it out, pour it out, Father. Pour it out on us, God. Pour it out, Father. Keep it, keep it in front of our minds, God, in front of our eyes, Lord, that we are the church. We are the church. We're the church of Jesus Christ. We're the greatest force that this planet has ever seen. Come on, we have, to, we have to believe that we are the greatest force of power on this planet that this world has ever seen. There is no, there is no enemy, there is no army, there is no ruler or king that can overcome the church of Jesus Christ. You and I are the church of Jesus Christ. We need to be encouraged, church. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Well, as we close, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you see, when John was writing to the church of Sardis, he was writing to the church. He was writing to believers. I want to make an opportunity for you in these last moments that if you're sitting in this room and you say, you know what, Pastor Rick, I don't know if, if, I'm a, if, if, if I believe. I don't know that I'm a Christian, but I want to. I want to make that, that decision. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. If that's you in this house right now, can you just give me a wave? Just give me a wave. Keep your hand up. I want to make sure everyone has an opportunity. Well, Father God, I just thank you again for what you've done here today. Lord, I pray that through this next week, you would impress upon our hearts those areas in our life, God, that we need to submit to you. <laughs> we love you, Jesus, and we thank you, God, for what you have done here. In Jesus' mighty name. Come on, if you believe that prayer, shout out me an incredible amen. Pastor Aaron, come on up.